So uh, the first thing I want to do, Jim, is we just introduced the project. Uh, now I want to know uh, when and what company you started in the steel pipe business. Okay. How long ago was uh, that? The when was in uh, September of 1951. Okay. I was a senior in high school. And one of my friends was working at the Valley Steel after school. And he says, Jim, you're looking for a job. And I says, of course I'm looking for a job. So I went down and interviewed with uh, the fellow that ended up hiring me. His name was Jim Fontana. Rough talking guy. He was uh, like the uh, treasurer. And uh, I was after school as a file clerk. And the uh, salespeople were about uh, 20 guys in a bullpen situation. Uh, uh, noisy, making for telephone calls. Everybody's on the phone that uh, just blowing and going. Typewriters, manual typewriters, clicking, sending quotations, letters with onion skin paper. And uh, uh, we didn't have the tools. We didn't have copy machines. We didn't have telex. We didn't, we didn't have anything except a telephone and uh, a boss that uh, was a hard driver. And how old were you? I was, uh, I was, six, uh, I was 17. I would turn 17 in uh, uh, May and I started uh, at Valley Steel in, in September. No, I take that back. I was 16, uh, 16. I was 16. I, uh, uh, I started before I graduated. I was 17 when I graduated from high school in 52. Okay. So I got my math wrong there. <laughs> and so how did and then the uh, Valley Steel job morphed after you graduated high school? Yes, graduated high school and uh, <clears throat> Didn't, didn't have the grades, the desire, or the money to go to college. Uh, I'd like the most guys in the blue collar neighborhood I grew up, you, you got out of high school, you got a job usually in a factory, you bought a used car, and you got married in that order. And, and I did. I was married when I was 20 years old. And uh, uh, I had just a love for the business. It was all new to me. Uh, Guys making telephone calls all over the country. I'm tracing shipments, rail shipments, truck shipments, um, lying to their customer about their deliveries, uh, you know, whatever they told me to do, I, I, I did. And I got a raise, I made 91 cents an hour. And uh, so in the, the following uh, August in 53, Don Toby, uh, a salesman at uh, Valley Steel, uh, was selected to go to Houston. They had a satellite office and yard in Houston with the idea either to make it go or close it. Well, uh, and uh, he took me with him as his gopher and trainee. And we worked 10, 12 hours a day, uh, just uh, working mimeograph, mailing, calling, uh, just working our tails off. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't make a, a go of it. We were basically in used in secondary pipe. And that was just in a time when Mannesman and the uh, German mills were bringing uh, API casing uh, over to the States. So uh, it lasted until uh, and in January of 54, uh, I was off my 91 cents an hour uh, salary to, to a 1% commission on gross sale. So uh, a struggle, uh, absolutely a struggle. We sold everything. We sold invasion pipe. We sold used boiler tubes, uh, a water well casing, uh, used oil field casing. And uh, so finally, it just, uh, uh, I was, had an office, uh, a bedroom in an office with a shower and a, and a, and a bathroom. And uh, it just got to the point where uh, I was starving. And uh, I called Mr. Cranster and I said, I'm, you know, I, I can't do this. I'm coming home. And uh, I was single and I was anticipating getting married in that August. And uh, he says, well, he says, come on. He said, we'll find you a place. So he took, took me into his office and he says, uh, we've got an office in Oakmulgee, Oklahoma, that I think you would fit into. And I says, no, no, I'm not going to Oakmulgee, Oklahoma. I'm not going anywhere. I'm either here or I get a different job. Well, and shortly, well, get yourself a desk and start selling pipe. And so it, it, it morphed from there, and I had a certain amount of success. We worked 10 hours was not an unusual time. Um, we uh, sold water well casing primarily on the East Coast. 
And uh, of course, that was an hour ahead of us. So you have to get there at six o'clock to catch the well driller before he went to work in the day. And then uh, you could leave at three. But when you started to leave at three, like, well, where, where, where are you going? It's, it, it's an hour earlier in Colorado. You know, I mean, he was, he didn't know much about pipe, but he knew about people. He got the utmost out of people through uh, one of his was fear, constant fear of you're going to you do you're going to lose your job. Uh, but uh, I survived and uh, had a certain amount of success and uh, just stayed with it. And so you were on the pipe sales desk now, right? When we're talking right. twenty years old, twenty one, just right. getting yes. married, right? And getting ready to start a family. And well, that, yes, that kind right, of yeah. And so was it was it just what I'm thinking in the back of my mind, which is an inside sales where you're dialing the phone all day? Inside sales, you uh, contact by phone. Uh, in all of my career, which spans a total of 68 years, I guess I have met face to face with less than 1% of the people I've done business with. And I've sold thousands of uh, customers in, in, in my career. Sure. Build relationships on phone. It's different than uh, sitting down like you and I and uh, looking each other in the eye and shaking hands and BSing a bit. Uh, you, you have to do your BSing quickly because the phone is, uh, the bill's running up. Right. But you build relationships and uh, I think has been uh, one of the keys to my success. Yeah. And we, you know, we talk about, I know it's a, it's an ongoing subject we talk about all the time is the changes that have happened. Um, you know, and we can talk about the the obvious changes of email and all those. But you, when you're when you were going through the fifties, the nineteen fifties, and into the sixties, did it remain pretty constant as to you know the type of business or what were some of the most prominent changes? It there? it was it was constant. You just uh, we dealt primarily in secondary in, in reject pipe. Uh, <clears throat> we had uh, Mr. Crancer had connections with. Uh, uh, Pittsburgh uh, Steel, Al Equipa Mill, and he had uh, Newport Steel in uh, Newport, Kentucky, or Wilder, Kentucky. And we, we, we sold rejects. So we got U.S. Steel rejects out of, uh, I've got some pictures here I'll show you that uh, uh, we just load up rail cars, or they load up rail cars, and we send them to Louisiana, Missouri. And could be anything from uh, uh, one inch pipe to 26 inch pipe. Uh, and uh, small stuff, and they didn't know what to do with it. So he was innovative. He started making uh, playground equipment out of uh, extra heavy and double extra heavy pipe. It was cheap enough to do that. Uh, swing sets, uh, clothesline poles, uh, picnic tables, uh, the whole hog. And he, a draw bench, he put a draw bench in that he drew uh, tubes down to square tubing and uh, reduce it to smaller rounds. And uh, they had their own coupling shop. They made pipe fittings at Carroll, Illinois. And so we had a fittings division and uh, it was just exciting. And it was the, shortly after the war and in, in the early, early 50s, uh, a lot of things were going on. The uh, farm uh, implement industry was just going crazy, uh, buying secondary material and the pipe business, as I, I figured, was more localized. You never heard of a guy from Chicago or St. Louis selling somebody pipe in Buffalo, New York. I mean, it just, it was localized. And there weren't many secondary dealers. The selling uh, Prime 853, of course, the price was like double uh, 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 the, the well driller. And we sell well drillers uh, pipe. We had thread, thread and couple it. And, uh, a lot of them had the old churn drills where they just pounded the the pipe into the ground and uh, uh, we run out of six inch pipe and he convinced us, told us that uh, he had a heck of a deal on seven inch OD. So we sold seven inch OD. We got double commission for selling seven inch OD because he bought it for scrap, basically. What were the price levels back then? Uh, six inch pipe for $2 a foot, 245, 250 a foot. That's, that's 10 cents a pound. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Two hundred dollars yeah, a ton. Yeah, it it was just it it was just cheap. Uh, every everything was cheap. Used boiler tubes we sold. Uh, um, uh, we would get an order, say in New York, and if you got a thousand feet, that's a half a truckload. Well, put out a 
little meeting. We need uh, to fill out a truck going there. So you sell it, you load the whole truck up and sell it on the way. That had some success. Of course, it didn't always work that way. And then he had return loads, picking up pipe at the mills to, to return to make the trucking. He owned like, we had like 40 trucks. It was big time. Yeah. Big time. And when you made double commission on 7-inch, what would be a, a, a commission amount? That oh, you... $40, $50 on a, on a load of pipe. I mean, it was a lot of money. Uh, the highlight of my young career in 1956 was a strike year. Tell me about that. Uh, well, the mills t went on strike. There was a steel strike, except Newport Steel in Kentucky ran. They made 4-inch and 6-inch uh, line pipe. And Mr. Cranser, the owner of the company, was tight with them. So we were, I was selling line pipe, API line pipe, to Kansas City Gas and Electric, to uh, Connecticut, to uh, California. Uh, just the year I was 21 years old, I made 20, over $20,000 on 1% commission on the gross sale. Now the next year, Back to reality, I think I made six thousand dollars, but that was uh, uh, Mr. Crancher would just uh, kind of I was his uh, trophy, I guess. Uh, visitors of mill coming, hey, a young kid, you know, working for me, made twenty thousand dollars, you know that. So you could buy a good house for twenty thousand. Well, uh, back I, then. I, in fact, the first house I bought cost sixteen thousand seven fifty, and I bought it the year that I made twenty thousand dollars and had some money left. That's so, fantastic. So it, it, it's a fun part. And uh, then uh, just continued selling and uh, growing and uh, always made a good living. Yeah. And sure. so that's... Uh, now, what about, you know, that you you uh, you talk about that fun year, you know, yes. that you made 20000 Tell us about maybe a, a down year. Oh, yeah. Smarter. I had, uh, uh, in fact, one uh, year after that, and I forget the, uh, the year... But uh, it was probably in midwinter and uh, had like two or three kids at home and uh, wife wasn't working and I wasn't making any money. So I went to Mr. Crancer and I just sat down and said, Mr. Crancer, uh, I, I'm, I'm not making a living. I've got to have more money or I've got to do something else. And he looked me right in the eye and he said, young man, if you make more money from working for me, you're going to sell more. And that's the only way you'll ever make more money working for me. And I thought, boy, what an SOB he is. But he was right. So I went back and doubled down. I, I, I was working hard, but I could work harder. And I worked my way, way out, of the, out of the jam and stayed in the business. And what year was that? Early 60s? Uh, no, late 50s. Late 50s. Late 50s. Uh, yeah, it was 57, 58, sure. 59. Were there any uh, going into the 60s and, and then the 70s, et cetera, where was there any big market uh, change that we know was a big downturn? Or, you no, know, I, I don't, I don't recall uh, a, a big downturn. Uh, just uh, uh, try to expand on uh, uh, clientele. Well drillers were getting pretty saturated and uh, uh, they were uh, tough buyers, man. <laughs> They go down the road for a nickel a foot, you know, that type thing. And so we got in construction. But in those days, and thank goodness the construction industry has cleaned up their act, they used to be a very, very slow pay industry. I mean, you had to wait forever to get your money. It was either that or don't take the, don't take the deal. Uh, but we always had plenty of supply and uh, uh, something to sell and just had to uh, keep going and selling it. You know, when I uh, got into the uh, pipe business in the early 80s, it seemed like um, St. Louis was a, a major hub for the steel pipe companies. Yes. And Valley Steel, of course, was one of the, the big ones. And you talk about Mr. Cranster, and he's in the NASP Hall right. of Fame. Um, you had mentioned in an earlier uh, conversation about uh, Pierre Labarge. Tell right. me about some of those main characters at Valley who you know, uh, were working at Valley Steel, yeah. but then well, maybe it started. Pierre Labarge was vice president uh, at Valley, and he did uh, mostly purchasing. Uh, uh, I, I didn't care for uh, Pierre Labarge. Uh, 
Uh, I thought he was uh, an arrogant SOB, and I, too bad I couldn't tell him that, but I was too low on the pole to do that. Uh, but uh, uh, Jack Houck, who left Valley uh, and uh, went on to his own and out at Tubular Steel, a tremendously successful company. Uh, one of the nicest men that I ever met in my life. Uh, I used to chase, uh, chase files for him. In fact... Uh, What's that mean, chase files? They had bells under their desk when they wanted a file. They rang the, the and of course the file, the guy that ran stayed there. I ran. This guy walked, they didn't last. And I mean, uh, these just salesmen. I mean, they were uh, ring, ring. Hey, kid, you know, I was boy or kid for the first year. I, I didn't have a name. And we had a, a, a an old rickety office. The next door was a, a company that made uh, uh, billiard tables. And the salesmen, some of the salesmen would park in their lot. And they had to have the cars out by five because they locked the lot. The, so Jack Houck uh, was one of the guys. He said, uh, hey kid, move my car. He never asked me if I knew how to drive. And I remember he had an old gray Dodge stick shift, but uh, I, I, I guess I kind of learned to <laughs> pull the car out of his. Uh, but, but just uh, fun things like that. Uh, so file runner, all you did, you were running files literally. Literally. Desk to the, what, to the what, whatever whatever the, the salesman wanted, they were, they got. And Mr. Krantzer wanted, uh, hey boy, get me, get me this or get me. It was just get me, get me. And we had a, a telephone uh, operator with plug in the little wires, like uh, old, old fashioned stuff. You couldn't dial a, uh, a long distance call. What do you mean? You, you had to go through an operator. You had to call the operator. I want to talk number if you had the number or Randy Hurst in uh, Spokane, Washington. Here's the name. And uh, she would either, she have to get a routing to do it. It was a slow process, very expensive process. But then finally it got to where you could dial direct and later on, and I don't know, I didn't keep track of when that happened. Sure. Because we had uh, the sequence operators that I mentioned to you before that your secretary, we usually shared a secretary, that would place the calls with the operator and she just would get people on the phone for you and then you go from there. And Mr. Hauk, uh, when he was at Valley Steel, was he in the sales? He was in sales and, and one of the top salespeople. And uh, he, uh, he and you just knew that that wouldn't be forever. He, he just had too much, too much going for him. So, so he left. And uh, uh, in fact, <laughs> he left and uh, uh, Mr. Krantzer, I had to go to Jack Houck's house and uh, uh, get a duplicate set of three by five cards that he took with him, his, his father. And uh, his Rolodex. His Rolodex. So I had to measure them. I didn't count them, I measured them. And then when he got them back, Mr. Krantzer measured them, made sure he got the same amount back. It was a clandestine uh, type thing. And uh, the political political stuff was involved in the city, and uh, uh, then, then Valley hit really hard times, uh, and uh, they got bailed out by the Teamsters Union. When this, was this about? Oh, well, this was in this was in the uh, '60s. I, I don't know exactly the '60s, but the Teamsters Union, uh, Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, was responsible for uh, getting the loan. In fact, Mr. Krantzer's youngest son, Bobby, married Jimmy Hoffa's daughter. Oh my. And they still live, uh, they're both still alive and they live here in uh, St. Louis. Uh, and uh, the the union sponsored uh, uh, Valley Steel to get in the, the working capital, the line of credit. And it all worked out great. and. Uh, it ended up great. Uh, everybody got paid and everybody was happy. Now, going back to um, the uh, into the your start with Valley Steel and in the 50s, um, you and I share a mutual friend, a good friend in Earl Cohen. Yes. And uh, Earl was a St. Louis boy and he got his start at Valley Steel. Right. And I, I do believe it was in the mid to late 50s. Yes, it was in 55, 57 in that era. Uh, <clears throat> Earl came to us through a connection that his father had with Mr. Cranser. Earl's father uh, owned a cab, he owned like three cabs. He was a, 
uh, cabby. And Earl came there and uh, he wasn't received well by a lot of the people. You know, let's figure you're, you're in the mid. Uh, he was Jewish. You know what? We didn't have any other Jewish people there. So there was some animosity with people that, you know. Uh, but uh, Earl and I just clicked. We just became friends and we've remained friends all of these years. And uh, I just love the guy. And uh, his health is really failing and it's uh, sad to, to know. But uh, he was uh, a good salesman. He worked hard. And uh, uh, L.B. Foster in uh, 63 or 64, it was, uh, I forget exactly the year, came to town recruiting salespeople and they hired a fellow by the name of Vince Leone. And Vince went to work for L.B. Foster on the West Coast. Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Then uh, I got a call from uh, L.B. Foster and they in interviewed me and offered me a position on the West Coast, which I had no desire in the world to do. I had a wife and three or maybe even that four. Did Vince three. work at Valley? Yes. Oh, yes. Vince was a uh, uh, salvaged uh, car salesman. <laughs> he was a good salesman, a hustler, a good uh, work, hard worker. And uh, then Earl accepted the, the job that uh, basically that I turned down. And he went to Los Angeles, and uh, as it turned out, the best move for both of us, Earl went on to make a lot of money. He had a great career. And uh, Vince, uh, unfortunately, passed away at a very early age. But his son is still in the business, and Mike. Mike is still in the business in, uh, in, in California. Yeah, so yeah. that's... Uh, and uh, there was another name, the Valley guy, that uh, you might have heard of, uh, being out with, Cutbirth. Arliss Cut Arliss Cutbirth, Arliss Cutbirth uh, worked at Valley Steel. Uh, they had a thread protector division, where they went out in the oil fields and uh, took gathered up the thread protectors that were removed from the casing as it ran down the hole, and they brought them back. I've got some photos here. I'll show you where they reconditioned them and sold them back to the mills. And then he left and started his uh, his own business and uh, had had quite a, a career. And his son Patrick was uh, uh, involved, and uh, he was tied in politically with Reagan. They were uh, pretty pretty close. Uh, so that's another uh, offspring of the uh, the valley. The tentacles are out there. <laughs> and that came up in conversation yesterday when I was interviewing with Robert Griggs and. I asked him point blank, you know, when I started in the business in the early 80s, there was, you know, the Valley Steel, LaBarge, Tubular Steel, LB Foster, right. and Jensko. Right. And I asked Robert, I said, why, you know, why St. Louis? And what, how did all these pipe companies happen? And he said, Valley Steel. Steel yes. You know, it's like, uh, like the, you know, the coaches have the, you know, the offspring, right, you right. know, the assistant coaches go off and, you know, become head coaches. Same thing in the steel pipe business. Right, right. There's a kind of a big bang theory. Well, the, you know that uh, uh, Valley was, uh, you could make some money there, but you had to sell an awful lot of stuff. So it was pretty easy to pick off their, their players by offering them more money. Money was the name of the game. Sure. And uh, so a lot of guys started uh, uh, at Valley and got an education at Valley and went out on their own and uh, a lot of good things uh, good things happened. Sure. Uh, if you could try to explain to somebody uh, coming up in the business the uh, amount of work uh, and effort that it takes to be successful, what would you say to a young person these days? Well, uh, it's... Uh, the young person today is different than the young person and, and Meyer, of course, but I think the principles still apply. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to have a good work ethic. You have to work hard. If you have to work long, if it does what it requires, and you have to work hard, and you have to have a good attitude, and you've got to have a passion for the business. Uh, I can't just, uh, I don't think it's just you can think, I'm, well, I'm going to work in the morning. Uh, I'm going to go sell some pipe in the morning. That's the attitude that you have. And uh, you maintain that and then build relationships with, with your customers and have them think of you uh, uh, when they need pipe. Treat them right. Uh, uh, be honest with them. 
and uh, that's a oxymoron a lot for a lot of the people in the pipe business. They had some some bad uh, some bad eggs in the in the pipe business, and it's cleaned its act up, I think, tremendously, uh, which is good. And uh, a lot of good people, just wonderful people in the pipe business. It's uh, competitors or friendly competitors, your competitors, you buy and sell, uh, and we're always glad to see each other. Did you have a mentor or a leader or a... Yeah, Don Toby, uh, the fellow that uh, took me to Houston with him. He was a salesman and a, one of the top salesmen. And uh, he took me under his wing. He was like 37 or 38 years old. And uh, we we lived together in, in Houston for about uh, eight months. We shared a motel uh, room. And then uh, when he came back to St. Louis, I got kicked out of the hotel and had a bunk bed in the office uh, the kitchen. <laughs> but uh, he poured his soul out to me. He taught me uh, uh, so many things about life and about the business. And, and he about was obviously sales. at Valley Steel. Yes, yeah. yes, at Valley Steel in, in Houston. And uh, uh, I just... Uh, I just listened to the guy because I, I was just so impressed with him. And he had the attitude, look, kid, I'm going to teach you everything I know. I won't hold back a thing, but I'll beat you any day of the week. That was just his attitude. And uh, as I've trained a lot of people in, in the pipe business, and I tried to adapt that same attitude that, look, you know, uh, I know what I'm doing, uh, you know, if. I'm going to teach you everything I know, but uh, if you ever want to challenge me, go do it. Yeah. And uh, as a result, I've trained some just absolutely fine people. Uh, Jeff Ritter uh, worked for me uh, at uh, at Valley Steel, and he's been tremendously successful. R3 Steel. R3 Steel. Glenn Reynolds at R3 Steel. Uh, 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 Glenn... Uh, Travis Thompson, who's passed away, was a salesman. Glenn's son... Uh, Dustin, he's, uh, uh, Glenn uh, was an unusual guy. Uh, he's oil country. And I told you, we had, to, uh, we had the deal with the U.S. Steel and LTV. And oftentimes I would offer cars to him and he'd flip them to people. And uh, we just, uh, we, we, we still communicate and uh, we're still uh, real close friends. Fantastic. That's great. Now, uh, did you have uh, uh, any good memories or uh, of course you have good memories, but of the N NASPD, were you, you know, a regular attendee? I was, a, I was a member of the uh, NASPD with three companies with Valley Steel uh, and it was Scott Supply. We were members. And then I was at Barnes Pipe. Now there was a couple of, uh, Windows when I wasn't involved in there, but I've been involved pretty much uh, since the seven, since its beginning. And um, you know, we to talk about the the genesis of going from Valley Steel and talk a little bit about Scott Supply and then how that then ended up being Barnes Pipe. And well, Scott Scott Supply, we uh, Bud, Bud Long, who was uh, with Lally, he and I went together and. Form Scott Supply and uh, it, what year was that? Jerry? 1987, I believe. Let me check my check my sheets. No, no, yeah, uh, yeah, 1987. Thank you. Uh, but, but Bud and I, uh, we we couldn't we couldn't we were bad mix. We just didn't see eye to eye. So rather than uh, we we. Uh, the bank called our loan, which we weren't behind of anything. Uh, we paid off uh, Capco, who was our sponsor, where they got their money. And the bank just decided that uh, they no longer wanted to uh, have us as a customer. And so uh, we, we settled out with the bank. We squared up with the bank. Uh, uh, they, they were satisfied, and, and we, we bailed out. And then Scott and I, or Bud Long and I, uh, uh, split the, the sheets. And Scott uh, Barnes and I, so they just changed the name and the same phone number. And we had a lot of ambition, a lot of desire. And Scott absolutely. Scott Barnes, your son. The Scott Barnes, my son, yes. He had worked for a year and a half or two at Valley. And of course, when I left Valley, he got fired. And 
I had a son-in-law that worked at Pally and he got fired. Well, my son-in-law didn't, didn't make it in the business, so he went on to some other things. But Scott and I, the two of us, we had a lot of ambition, a lot of desire, and absolutely no money. <laughs> so the first two years that we were in business, we survived and grew what I call integrity financing. The integrity part was people that I've done business with over the years, Earl Cohen. Earl Scott had an order in Georgia. He sold two carloads of pipe, bought it from Earl Cohen. It was like $80,000. So Earl, a couple days later, he calls me and says, Jimmy, he used to call me that, Jimmy. He says, my controller or my credit man says, we don't have any, any credit information on you. And I said, Earl, if you had credit information on you, you wouldn't take the order. We don't have any money. We just don't. I said, we've got an order. It's a good order. The guy's good pay, and I'll, I'll pay you in 30 to 45 days, absolute max. I promise you that. He says, okay, that's good enough for me. Pete Knowles, the same thing. Now, Pete was a tough, tough guy to deal with. I mean, uh, you had to be on... You couldn't slip up with Pete. I mean, uh, if you said it's the check was Friday, then uh, it better be there Friday but he gave us credit. Uh, Jerry Rubenstein gave us credit. So people like that uh, are the reason that uh, we survived until we got to the point where we could get a bank that was interested in talking to us. Sure. And uh, our, our word, we kept our word, we paid our bills, and there was many, many a months that went by when Scott and I either one of us didn't get a paycheck or we trade off, but who got paid because the vendors had to be paid first. Sure. And the third month we were in business, uh, a fellow in Arkansas uh, stiffed us for $18,000. Uh, 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 I, I, the name escapes me. I tried to get it out of my mind. But uh, we, we, we've done well, we've, uh, we've, our banking, everything, we've, uh, we've grown, uh, and uh, we've got a nice company. That's great. And the highlight of my, my career is to work every day with my son. We've been doing it now for about 33 years. Uh, he's the president, and I'm the vice president. He's the majority owner. And the re we started, he was the president when we started because at Valley Steel, it was a good company, but the, it, went, it went broke. And the primary reason it went broke, they had two co-leaders that uh, couldn't make a, they had to, uh, how do I phrase it? If there was a situation, there was a situation. They would meet in the middle of the road, not to offend each other. When the real answer was either over here or over here, right. so that that happens. So uh, I said to Scott, We're, "You're going to be the tiebreaker. If we we each have our own opinions and our own voice, but it comes down to a tiebreaker. You're the tiebreaker because you're. That's just the way it is. I've done this for my. So you got to start uh, okay. start at the top." And in uh, twenty, we're in our thirtieth year. We've never exercised that uh, that that uh, part of our agreement. Sure, that's awesome. It's uh, it, it works because it's out of love and respect sure. of each other. Of course. Circling back to the NASPD, you say that you've been uh, a member of the NASPD as of three companies: Valley right. Steel, and Scott Supply, and then now Nat Barnes yes. and Steel. And you were elected into the NASPD Hall of Fame. Yes, Day. that's uh, got a highlight of my, my career. Uh, seven years ago yes, already. Yes. Um, and uh, you were you were brought into the NASPD Hall of Fame the same night that Earl Cohen, Earl Cohen was. Right. And I thought that was a, a great uh, tribute in itself. A little touch on history. Uh, we were two of five X Valley Steel that are in the Hall of Fame. Jack Houck, mm -hmm. Ducky Aiden was with us for a while. And, uh, and of course, Mr. Cranston. Mr. Cranston, yes. So yeah. five of the current sure. crop, and there's, it's growing every year, naturally it's growing, but uh, it, it's, 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 I think it makes a statement about uh, Valley Steel as being a pioneer of the industry. Absolutely. Uh, so circling back to the NASPD meetings, did you ever have a favorite 
or one that really was memorable uh, that you had attended over the years? Well, um, uh, I attend a lot of them and I always had a good time. Uh, I had an old friend, uh, uh, Canadian guy, uh, uh, that uh, Bob uh, uh, Grayson, the uh, Gray Mac. Oh, yeah. Bob, Bob and I became uh, just absolutely close, close friends. Uh, happened on him by mistake. We were looking for pipe one time and uh, called. Uh, uh, Prudential Steel, and they offered us some pipe, and Grayson uh, uh, offered to thread it for us. And uh, Casper, Wyoming. Well, this was in Calgary before the Casper. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Bob and I just uh, we just hit it off. We we, we just hit it off, and uh, uh, he was a, a character, a real real character, uh, but knew what he was doing. And then uh, uh, we he was at the party, and and. I remember Jack Adams when Jack was a president and uh, uh, Mike Dim from uh, Pipe and Piling uh, and uh, the other fellow that, uh, my goodness, my memory is fading me. Uh, anyway, he couldn't drink very good and Casper, Wyoming one time around dinner, all of a sudden he's head down in, the, in his uh, potatoes or whatever, but uh, that, that, was a, <laughs> that was a fun thing. But Jack, uh, Mike, Mike Dim was a, uh, a character. Uh, 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 he was, depending on who you were, you either liked him or you didn't like him, but uh, he was just tougher than a, than a rusty nail. He, he, uh, but we got along fine. Uh, he would call me up and he'd say, uh, Jim, so-and-so company's down in your way. He wants to buy some pipe for me. She got any money? And I said, well, Jack, you, you, I mean, Mike, I says, he, he pays his bills. He pays my bills. I said, okay. You know, okay. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Mike passed on and uh, his company, Ender, takes care of his company now and uh, had my skirmishes with him over the years. But, uh, but uh, uh, I remember uh, a, lot, a lot of the, uh, the presidents of uh, uh, Joe Bergfeld, the president, uh, and uh, Arnold, uh, he was president. Bobby Jacobson. Uh, got to know a lot of nice people. Uh, Jerry Rubenstein. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, my interest in, in the NASPD is somewhat... Uh, I, I'm not active anymore. I, I don't travel that much anymore. Uh, but uh, I think needs to be more attention paid to pipe distributors than uh, I think they've kind of left the corral a little bit and a lot to mills and uh, uh, other uh, associate uh, companies. And uh, the mills are in, in there and uh, of course uh, the mills are, are changing. Uh, uh, they're, they're, uh, I think we're gonna be uh, uh, out scratching for something to do one of these days. I think the mills are on a plan to uh, take us out of the, what we're doing. Out of the distribution. Out of the distribution. Yeah. It's already started, uh, but I, I think it's, it, it's a distribution is still a, something to do. Uh, uh, the, the changes, uh, the course of the internet, uh, we have an old saying that uh, uh, on the phone, you used to get a guy on the phone, he said, man, he says, I need this and I've looked all over and I can't find it. Well, you rub your hands together and I'm gonna take this guy to Peoria, you know, well, now they just put it on the internet and hell, they find it the same as you're going to find it, you know? So it, it, it's changed, but uh, uh, like Scott says, it beats working for a living. <laughs> right, exactly. Well, as we get towards the end of this interview, I've got a, just a couple more questions um, that I want to ask you. And one of them is, uh, besides your steel pipe career, besides that, um, what are maybe one of the most things that you are proud of and what gives you the greatest joy and satisfaction? Well, uh, in the industry, being uh, elected to the NSBD Hall of Fame, I consider a great honor. Uh, in there was just some absolutely fantastic uh, pipe people. Uh, and to be uh, in the same group is, is one of the highlights of my career. And the real highlight of my career is, like I said before, it's been in like 33 years uh, working every day with, with my son. And to see him grow and to, uh, in whatever way, to help him grow. 
we're, we're different as night and day in how we approach things, but they both work and we respect each other's way of doing it and encourage each other. Sure. Uh, but out, outside of the uh, uh, pipe business, I guess I've lived a pretty mundane life. I, I don't hunt, I don't fish, I don't ski, I don't play golf, uh, but I, I, I still get a kick out of selling pipe. That's why I'm still, still here today. Although I've cut back a good deal. My wife and I are doing more traveling. And uh, I've, I've, had a, I've had a fantastic career, satisfying career. Uh, uh, surprised that uh, never thought in a world that I'd live to be 84 years old, but uh, the Lord's blessed me and I'm still I'm still kicking. Fantastic. You look great, Jim. Thank you. You Thank look great. You. I sure enjoyed our time. I did too. Yep. Thank you, Garrett. Thank you, Randy. Yep, yep. you got it, Jim. Thanks. All right, good, sir.